Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Devine and I am the Child Trafficking Prevention and Protection Coordinator at the HHS Office on Trafficking in Persons. I'm so grateful for all of you that are on today and I'm so grateful for your ongoing collaboration in supporting foreign national minor victims of trafficking. Today we're going to be discussing the process for assessing, screening, and reporting concerns of human trafficking on behalf of foreign national minors. So this includes any child under the age of 18 currently in the United States with concerns of them experiencing human trafficking at any point in their life um, so that they could report that they were forced to work or engage in commercial sex in any location and at any point in their life, whether here in the United States, in their home country, or during their journey to the United States. So before we get going, I wanna share a short video clip that discusses our process. Human trafficking is a public health issue that affects children everywhere. Children may be forced to work in a restaurant, in construction, on a farm, in someone's home, or other locations. They may be made to have sex in exchange for food, shelter, or to pay off a debt. Every child's story is different. In 2000, Congress passed the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, or TVPA which protects all children living in the United States who have experienced trafficking, including those who were born in other countries. Through the TVPA as amended, foreign national minors who experience human trafficking can receive assistance. This assistance is made possible through an eligibility letter from our office, the Office on Trafficking in Persons, which is located within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. With this letter, children can apply for benefits and services such as Medicaid, food assistance, cash assistance, foster care, and other needs to the same extent as refugees. If you know of a foreign national minor who may have experienced human trafficking at any point in their life, before or after arriving in the United States, you can submit a request for assistance, or RFA, through Shepherd, our secure online case management system. Anyone can submit an RFA on behalf of a child, including child welfare workers, case managers, teachers, counselors, doctors, nurses, attorneys, law enforcement officers, or other advocates. The TVPA requires federal, state, and local officials to report trafficking concerns involving a foreign national minor to our office within 24 hours of discovering a potential trafficking situation. Once a person submits an RFA, our office will review the request and contact them. We may also connect the child to a case manager to receive trafficking-specific comprehensive case management services in order to support the child and their family. After we evaluate the RFA, there are three possible outcomes. We determine that the child has experienced human trafficking and we issue an eligibility letter. We require more information to make a determination, so we issue an interim assistance letter to allow our office more time to review the case and consult with other organizations. We determine that there is not information indicating forced labor or commercial sex and issue a denial. If you learn new or clarifying information about a potential trafficking experience, you can always submit a new request on the child's behalf. After receiving an eligibility or interim assistance letter, the child can apply for benefits and services with the help of their case manager, family member, or other adult. If you have questions about the child eligibility process or whether you should submit an RFA, contact us at childtrafficking at hcf.hhs.gov or 202-205-4582. Thank you for learning about the child eligibility process. Together, we can assist survivors and help end child trafficking. To access the Shepherd Case Management System, visit acf.hhs.gov slash OTIP slash victim hyphen assistance slash Shepherd. Great. Well, we first just wanted to share that video um, as um, it discusses the general overview of this process. Um, and for the remainder of this presentation, we're going to be discussing that process in a lot more detail. So for those of you who just had a few minutes, we wanted to make sure to share that general overview of everything. And then um, for the remainder of the presentation, we'll be going through that in, a, in great more detail. Um, so again, thank you all so much for, for joining. Um, and uh, with that, we'll get going. <laughs> 
So for today, we're going to be giving a general overview of the Office on Trafficking in Persons, or OTIP. Um, in section two, we'll be discussing the federal definitions of human trafficking coming from the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 as amended. In section three, we'll be discussing the screening and identification process for foreign national victims of trafficking. Section four, the reporting process, which again was broken down a bit in that video we just shared, um, but this will go in a bit more detail. Section five, the benefits and services that these children are eligible for. And section six, we'll be discussing some of the case trends that we see in our office. So first, the Office on Trafficking in Persons, also known as OTIP. So that's our acronym. So you may hear it referred to as OTIP um, or Office on Trafficking in Persons. We're located within the US Department of Health and Human Services. And overall, our office is looking to address trafficking from a public health framework. So looking at how do we prevent trafficking from occurring in the first place? And then should trafficking occur, how do we respond to that trafficking and ensure that a victim is connected to um, benefits and services that help them to rebuild their lives and become self-sufficient? So major function of our office are protection, prevention, and research and policy. So today we're going to be discussing the child eligibility process, and that's that specific process related to uh, connecting foreign national minor victims of trafficking to benefits and services to the same extent as a refugee. In addition, under protection, we have our general victim service and assistance activities, our grant programs, including our domestic victims of human trafficking um, grant program, as well as our trafficking victims assistance program, which we'll talk about a bit later, and that is specific case management services for foreign national victims of trafficking. We'll also be discussing our adult certification program, um, which is certification for benefits and services for adult victims of foreign national adult victims of trafficking, as well as our national human trafficking hotline. Um, in addition, we have our prevention function, um, which includes training and technical assistance, survivor engagement and public awareness, as well as regional coordination and prevention education. And then our research and policy, which includes identification, coordination and implementation of our anti-trafficking anti research agenda. So you'll see some of those, those programs highlighted below. Um, some of you may be familiar with our National Human Trafficking Hotline, which is available 24 seven and is available in 200, over 200 languages, um, as well as our National Human Trafficking Training and Technical Assistance Center, or NITAC, and then our Look Beneath the Surface Public Awareness Campaign. Okay, so with that, we'll get into the, the detailed aspect of this training, which is the definitions of human trafficking. So for those of you who are on this, you all are probably very familiar with human trafficking um, and have different experience when thinking through the definitions of human trafficking. So different state and states may um, define human trafficking in different ways, but today we're specifically looking at the federal definitions of human trafficking under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 as amended, or 22 U.S. Code 7102. And the easiest way to think about human trafficking is to instead instead of saying labor trafficking or sex trafficking, the, the most simple way of thinking about it when thinking about children or any, any person under the age of 18 is saying forced labor or commercial sex. So if a child was forced to work or engage in commercial sex, so that's a sex act in exchange of something of value, so it could be money, food, shelter, we would say that child is a victim of trafficking. So if a child tells you that they were forced to work in Honduras 10 years ago, they would be considered a victim of trafficking. Or if a child tells you that they were brought to the United States for the purpose of engaging in sex acts in exchange for something of value or brought here for the purpose of working against their will, they would be considered a victim of human trafficking. So again, today we're discussing foreign national minors, any child under the age of 18, currently in the U United States, non-US citizen, non-lawful permanent resident, which would include unaccompanied children, um, if they report any forced labor or commercial sex at any point in their life, that would be a case you would want to submit our way. So what is human trafficking, specifically in looking at those federal definitions? Again, labor trafficking is forced labor, so the individual is compelled to work or provide services through the use of forced fraud or coercion. And then sex trafficking is commercial sex. And again, we're specifically talking about children today, so that's any commercial sex act um, induced um, without any forced fraud or coercion present. So the child can either tell you that they willingly engage in the commercial sex act or that they were forced to engage and either way they're considered a victim of sex trafficking. So trafficking versus smuggling. We receive a lot of cases where children are brought across the border against their will um, or during their journey across the border um, they may experience some type of exploitation. 
But what makes smuggling smuggling is that smuggling is that movement from one location to another. So that transnational physical movement from one location to another. Whereas trafficking has to entail that forced labor or commercial sex. So smuggling in and of itself is not human trafficking. But if the child indicates to you that during their journey, they were forced to work or engage in commercial sex, that the reason they came to the United States was for the purpose of forced labor or commercial sex, or that they left because they have been exploited through human trafficking, then that would be a case of trafficking. So smuggling in and of itself, that movement is not trafficking. However, if the child is, does experience that forced labor or commercial sex in relation to that movement, then we would say that child is a victim of trafficking. And something that we also point out is that trafficking doesn't have to entail any movement. So a child can be in one location, um, they can be forced to work, held in a warehouse, or they can be um, in, you know, at their home and uh, made to engage in a commercial sex act, exchange, provided something of value to engage in a sex act, and they would be considered a victim of human trafficking regardless of any movement. So smuggling has to entail some type of movement um, and may also include trafficking. Um, and another thing that we say is that smuggling is a vulnerability that may lead to someone being more vulnerable to experience trafficking. So often a child may travel alone and therefore may be at greater risk um, for experiencing trafficking or may have some type of debts related to their smuggling experience and therefore may be at greater risk. Okay, so trafficking versus ransom is another um, exploitation that we like to um, delineate between and kind of describe the differences between because we often receive cases where children are held against their will in a warehouse and their family is forced to send money in exchange for the child being able to leave the warehouse. That, that situation would be considered ransom or extortion. So if a child indicates to you that they're held against their will and that their family was contacted to send money or they would be killed, um, that would be a case of ransom. But what would make that trafficking is if the child tells you that while they were held, they were forced to work or engage in commercial sex then we would say not only are they a victim of ransom, but they're also a victim of trafficking. So anytime a child indicates to you that they're held in their journey or that they experience ransom, you always wanna ask more questions and say, you know, tell me more about while you were held for ransom. Talk to me more about your day-to-day -day schedule. Tell me more about hour to hour, you know, what, what you experienced. Um, because the child may not see what they experience as work. Um, and then they may, so if you just say, you know, tell me more about your schedule, talk to me more about while you were held what you did, and they tell you, oh, well, I was forced to make lunches or I was forced to um, do some construction while I was held for ransom. Um, and, and I was threatened that if I didn't do it, I would be harmed. That then would be forced labor and that would be a case of trafficking. Or, you know, tell me more about how you were able to leave the ransom situation. Maybe they tell you, oh, well, the person told me if I have sex with them, then that money will be paid for and I could leave. Um, well, then that we, we would have a situation of commercial sex or sex trafficking. So again, a ransom case in and of itself is not trafficking, but you always wanna assess and ask more questions because a child being held for ransom may be at greater risk for experiencing human trafficking. And then finally, one other thing we wanna separate, um, the difference between labor exploitation and labor trafficking. This can be kind of tough and something that I'll say a few times throughout the presentation, but specifically here, is if you ever have a case that you're not sure about and you're not sure whether to submit it to our office you're not sure whether it's a case of trafficking or whether it's a case of exploitation, um, we would really encourage you to reach out to us and staff the case. Um, our case staffing line is 202-205-4582. Um, and that phone number will be at the end of the presentation on the final contact slide. Um, but again, it's 202-205-4582. And if we don't answer, leave a voicemail and we'll make sure to get back to you. You can also contact us through email at childtrafficking at hcf.hhs.gov. Um, and again, if you have a case where you're working with a child and you think, okay, this may be like labor exploitation or this may be ransom, but I, I think this could also potentially be forced labor or commercial sex. It may also be trafficking, but I don't know. Just know you can reach out to us and we can help staff it and help you figure out what more questions you may wanna figure out. Um, and we can also just help you submit the case. So if you're in a situation where you don't have time to submit the case and you need help, um, you can also reach out to us there. Um, I also want to encourage you throughout the webinar to use the chat box. Um, at the very end of the webinar, we'll be going through all your questions in the chat box and answer um, and clarify anything that may be of confusion. So please use that chat box or the, the question and answer feature and we'll make sure to clarify anything we go over. Okay, so labor exploitation versus labor trafficking. Labor exploitation 
is those situations where a child maybe tell you, tells you that, you know, they thought they were going to get paid one amount of money for their work, but instead they were, they were not paid as they were promised. Or maybe they tell you that they worked and they had to work long hours, they didn't have meal breaks, um, maybe there was uh, unsafe working conditions, uh, maybe they had to live at the work site. All of those situations could be red flags for trafficking, but in and of itself don't indicate forced labor, so don't indicate trafficking. What would lead to a labor trafficking situation is if that child was being deprived or disoriented, they're being threatened with violence, they're demoralized, they're held against their will, intimidated, controlled, um, they experience sexual assault in relation to the work, use of um, or threatened use of the law, so threatened deport deportation, threat of being arrested, threatened, threat of the, the police being contacted, um, physical beat beatings, um, also debt. So if the child tells you that they were working and they kept having to work to pay off a debt and the debt was ever increasing or there was a high interest rate, all of those things may indicate labor trafficking. And sometimes it really is tough to delineate between the two. Um, and so what we always say is when in doubt, report it to us and we can help figure it out. Um, we would we really encourage you to submit cases where the child may be a victim of trafficking. So there's red flags, but you aren't totally sure. Um, because again, we know how busy you are. We know that um, figuring all of this out may be really challenging. So if you have cases and you're not sure if it meets that, that actual definition of labor trafficking or sex trafficking, we still really encourage you to submit those cases to us. Okay, so that first definition from the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 as amended or the, or the 22 US Code 7102 is labor trafficking. And this is forced labor. This is the recruiting, harboring, transporting, providing, or obtaining of a child for labor or services through the use of forced fraud or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. And what we use is the action means and purpose model or the ant model to basically break down those definitions that we saw in that last slide or that definition in the last slide. So labor trafficking, as we mentioned, is the actions are recruiting, harboring, transporting, providing, obtaining. The means are forced fraud or coercion and the purposes are involuntary servitude, debt bondage, peonage, or slavery. So to prove that a child is a victim of labor trafficking or that they experience forced labor, we have to prove one action, one means, and one purpose. So if a child tells you that they were held in a warehouse and they were threatened to be killed or, um, and they were made to make t-shirts, so they were forced to make t-shirts over and over again, we would say that the action is harboring, so they were held against their will, harboring, they were harbored. The means that we would choose would be coercion because they were threatened to be killed. And the purpose would be involuntary servitude because they were forced to work against their will. So for that case, we would be able to show that that child is a victim of labor trafficking because we were able to prove one action, one means, and one purpose. Um, it can be a one-time occurrence, so they can say they were forced to make t-shirts on one occasion, or in that same situation, the child can tell you that they were held against their will and threatened to be killed if they don't make t-shirts, and the child says, but I saw a door and I was able to run out and escape and I never made the t-shirts. We would still say that the child was harbored through the use of coercion for the purpose of involuntary servitude. So even in those cases where the child gets out of the trafficking scheme or maybe law enforcement intervenes or something happens where the child doesn't actually engage in that forced labor or they're brought here for the purpose of that forced labor, we may still be able to indicate that they're a victim of, of labor trafficking. So again, when in doubt, submit those cases to us and we can help figure out whether or not um, that child is eligible for benefits and services as a victim of trafficking. Okay, so first we went over labor trafficking or forced labor. And now we'll be discussing sex trafficking of minors or commercial sex. So this definition again comes from 22 U.S. Code 7102 or the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 as amended. It's the recruiting, harboring, transporting, providing, obtaining, soliciting, or patronizing of a child for the purpose of engaging in a commercial sex act. And again, we use that same AMP model, but this is different because the child experiencing sex trafficking, there doesn't need to be any means or any force, fraud, or coercion. So the actions are recruiting, harboring, transporting, providing, obtaining, soliciting, or patronizing. And due to the passing of the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act, we actually have these additional definitions of actions that were added to the definition in the, the TVPA of 2000 as amended, so soliciting and patronizing. 
Soliciting is the offer of a something of value in exchange for a sex act. So an example of that would be if the child is walking down the street and a gang member says, I'll pay you $50 to have sex with me. That child would then be considered um, solicited for the purpose of a commercial sex act and maybe considered a victim of trafficking. Even if the child walks away, never engages in the sex act, um, the exchange never occurs, because that gang member successfully solicited the child for the purpose of a commercial sex act, we would still wanna see that case regardless of whether the sex act or exchange ever happened. And then patronizing that final action on the list is when there's a third party involved. So let's say a child tells you that their grandmother um, or a grandmother told the landlord, um, you can have sex with my child if you let my rent be paid for. So the child isn't receiving that something of value, but there's an engagement with the landlord and grandmother. So there's a third party involved. That would be patronizing. So that child isn't being exchanged uh, something of value, but someone is receiving it in exchange for that child engaging in a sex act. So soliciting is, is offer of something of value in exchange for a sex act. And then the patronizing is that third party involved. So we'll go through these definitions in a bit more detail, but I just wanted to kind of explain those differences um, between the ant models, between labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Okay, so sex trafficking of minors. Some of the things we want to delineate between and just some nuanced things we want to talk through. Um, one, the something of value can include money, food, shelter, gifts, transportation, anything that's commercial in value. So it doesn't have to be specifically money, but it has to be something that could be exchanged for something that's commercial. Um, also, in regards to child sexual abuse material, we see we receive a lot of cases where a child may be um, uh, made to provide nude photos to someone. If in the nude photos, the child is depicted or made to engage in a sexual act, or there's a video of the child being depicted or made to engage in a sexual act, um, and there's something of value exchange, we, we could then say that child is a victim of sex trafficking. But nude photos in and of itself in exchange wouldn't be considered sex trafficking because there's no sex act involved. Um, another difference there is if the child is forced to pose nude for photos, um, so no sex act, but the child is forced to pose nude in photos, and those photos are, the person demands that on a regular basis and threatens the child, we could potentially say that that child was the service or labor they per performed happened to be um, posing, um, modeling, or, or some type of nature providing those photos, and that's the labor or service and maybe actually labor trafficking. So if you ever have a case with nude photos and you're not sure whether it's, it's solely child sexual abuse material or if it may be additional things that may be including sex trafficking or labor trafficking, Again, always reach out to us at that case staffing line, um, or we can, or you can submit the case and we can let you know one way or the other. Um, when we're talking about sexual act, it comes from the federal law under 18 U.S. Code 2246, and it includes oral, anal, vaginal sex, or digital penetration, or touching underneath the clothing in the genital region if the child is under the age of 16. Um, again, if you're not sure whether it's a sexual act or not sure whether it's sex trafficking, again, we just encourage you to submit that case to us or give us a call and we can help figure that out. Um, and then finally, we highlighted this a bit, but even if the sex act or exchange never occur, the solicitation alone for a commercial sex act may be considered sex trafficking of a minor. So the actions, um, we just wanna talk through these in a bit, bit more detail so you can kind of understand some of the nuances. Um, again, if the action itself is successful, like we talked about in that example um, a couple of slides ago where the child was held against their will, forced to make t-shirts, um, but then they left and they never actually made the t-shirts, that would be a successful harboring because they were successfully harbored somewhere, but then they left. Um, so that would be why they were still in the midst of that scheme and maybe considered a victim of labor trafficking. So when we're talking about recruitment, that's that first action, we're talking about did the child have some type of vulnerability that was used against them for the purpose of exploitation? Did they meet some type of specific profile where there's some type of grooming behaviors learned or behaviors used? So a specific recruitment would be um, a child is walking down the street and MS-13 says, hey, you have to sell these drugs for us or we're going to kill you. The child takes the drugs because they don't want to be killed and they sell the drugs for the gang members. That would be a successful recruitment because the child was singled out and actually performed the service or labor they were singled out for. Now, if the child is walking down the street and MS-13 says, I'm going to kill you if you don't sell these drugs for us, and the child says no and walks away and never sells the drugs for them, that would not be a successful recruitment and the child would not be a victim of labor trafficking. However, if in that same scenario, the child refuses, but then MS-13 grabs the child, puts the child in a car, drives the child to a warehouse and holds the child there and says, you're here for the purpose of selling 
uh, the drugs. And again, the child, let's say the child escapes. So it never happens. The child was successfully obtained because they were forcibly taken. They were successfully transported because they were taken in a car and they were successfully harbored because they were, they were held in a warehouse. So even though in that incident, the actual act and the labor never happened, we can still show that that child is a victim of trafficking. So that's where these actions can really uh, shift a case and why we may ask more questions when we follow up with you to make sure that the action wasn't, wasn't successful and the child wasn't in the midst of a scheme. So harboring is that the child is held against their will, they're confined to a specific location, maybe their communications or movements are monitored. Transporting of a child is the child is taken from one location to another, um, it could also include they have travel arrangements, so they're being, um, you know, provided travel from a country to the United States or to another country um, or to any location um, and have some type of travel arrangements plan. Provision of a child is the child is provided out to a third party employer or third party individual. Um, and so we see these a lot in family work cases where a child is provided to work by a caregiver or a family member. Um, and they're provided out to a third party and forced to work against their will. So they'd be provided. Obtained is, think of that example I provided, but that would be similar to a kidnapping. So the child is forcibly taken by an individual for the purpose of forced labor or commercial sex. And then these last two, again, are just for sex trafficking. And they have asterisks to, to delineate that, to make clear that these are not for labor trafficking. But soliciting is, was the child offered or promised something of value? in exchange for a sex act. And then patronizing is, was any person offered or giving something of value in relation to the child engaging in a sex act? Next, we have means. And again, this is only for labor trafficking, not for sex trafficking. Um, what we say is force is physical, coercion is psychological, and fraud is deception. So force physical would be sexual assaults, beatings, physical confinement, isolation. Coercion would be psychological, so that would be threats of harm, psychological manipulation, climate of fear, threatening their life or the safety of the child or someone else, withholding their legal documents, threat of deportation, threat of law enforcement, um, increasing debt um, that feels impossible to pay off, um, witnessing harm to others, abuse or threatened abuse of the legal system. And then fraud deception would be false promises about work and living conditions, use of fraudulent travel documents, fraudulent employment offers, offers or changes in agreement or nature of a relationship. And then finally, purpose. Sometimes it can be helpful to actually start with your purpose to figure out, um, is there any forced labor or commercial sex? And then going back and, and figuring out an action of means. Again, you all don't have to figure that out. You can send those cases our way if you have any concerns of forced labor or commercial sex. But it's always good. I just want to clarify that for you, that sometimes it is helpful to start at purpose. So the purposes are for labor and voluntary servitude, um, which is that forced labor. So that's any scheme, plan, or pattern made to cause a person to believe that if they don't perform the work, um, they will be threatened. We also use um, what's called involuntary sexual servitude here. Um, so that would be um, uh, a case where a child may experience um, what's similar to interpersonal violence or um, domestic servitude where they're held against their will and forced to perform sex acts over and over. Um, that would actually fall under labor trafficking in cases where there's no, no value um, provided in exchange. And then debt bondage is when there's a labor associated with a debt that's increasing or never decreases. Peonage is labor with threat of death, uh, threat of harm or death for non-compliance. So peonage is there's debt, um, but it may be a fake debt. So someone may say, oh, well, um, you, um, you know, used um, my, my house the other day to, or you, you slept in my house the other day. So now you owe me $5,000. Um, now you have to work for me and I'm going to kill you if you don't work for me. That would be a peonage case. Um, it can get a little confusing figuring out debt bondage versus peonage. So what I always say is if you have any concerns of forced work associated with the debt, um, definitely send it our way and we can help figure that out. And then slavery is it, are cases where a child is, is held against their will and they're forced to perform labor or services. Day-to-day um, -day life is, is often for that purpose of performing those labor or services. Um, it's, it's usually very, very extensive cases, um, also cases of sexual slavery. Um, typically, before we, we prove a case of slavery, we've already um, been able to, to, to say that that case is involuntary servitude or, or peonage or debt bondage. Or, um, so often we don't uh, prove that a case of slavery, um, but we do see those types of cases um, every now and again. And then finally, Commercial Sex Act, um, this is any sexual act in exchange for something of value. 
um, and it can be given to or received by any person, like those examples with patronizing, with that grandmother, um, with the landlord situation. Um, and again, the sexual act and exchange don't actually have to occur. There just has to be that intent and inducement or solicitation for the commercial sex act. So all of that being said, lots of information. We want to go through a few test your knowledge. Um, so I'm going to describe the incident and then we'll give a little bit of time for you to think through what your answer would be. Um, if you want to put it in the chat box, you're welcome to. Unfortunately, I'm not able to see the, the chat box at this time, but we'll definitely go through the answers at the end um, and I'll help kind of walk through it. So feel free to, to take some guesses and put it in the chat box. So the first test your knowledge is a child is brought into the United States by a coyote. Once in the United States, the coyote demands more money from the child's family and holds the child in a warehouse for three weeks until the child's family sends additional money. While held, the child is told that if she attempts to leave, she will be killed. So first you wanna ask yourself, do I see any forced labor or commercial sex? So any labor trafficking or sex trafficking? And then you wanna ask yourself, if I do, what is my action, my means, and my purpose? Um, and then if I don't see any forced labor or commercial sex, what more questions do I need to ask? So in this case, um, I look at it at, at first and I actually don't see any indication of forced labor or commercial sex. So I don't, I don't need to go to proving my action, means, and purpose because I don't have those concerns. But that means I wanna ask more questions. So this is definitely a case of ransom or extortion but not a case of trafficking. And so I wanna make sure it's not a case of trafficking. So I would ask the child, you know, tell me more about why you're held. Talk to me about your schedule. Tell me more about what you did day to day and how you were you know, able to eventually leave. Um, talk to me more about that. And just make sure to assess, did the child experience any forced labor or commercial sex or were they held for those purposes? So if the child after additional follow-up tells you no and you have no indication, then you wouldn't need to submit a case to our office. There, that child would be a victim of extortion or ransom and not a victim of trafficking. So this case in and of itself, we would say this child is not a victim of trafficking, but again, we would wanna ask more questions. Okay, so test your knowledge number two. While crossing the border, the child's guide tells the child that she has to have sex with him in order to pay off her parents' smuggling debt. The child agrees because she does not want to work when she gets to the United States to pay off the debt. The guide engages in sexual acts with her and tells her that her debt is now paid. So we'll do the same thing here. We'll ask, do we see any forced labor or commercial sex? And sometimes people get thrown off by debt being involved. Um, remember that commercial sex, the commercial value doesn't have to be um, specifically a money monetary exchange. It can include debt. So in this case, we would say that this child is a victim of sex trafficking. We would say that the child was successfully solicited and recruited for the purpose of commercial sex because they were asked or offered to have sex in exchange for something of value in exchange for the smuggling debt. And then we would say recruited because they were singled out and the act actually did occur. So they did engage in the act. Um, in this same scenario, if the child refused and walked away and never engaged in the sexual act, would you still send that case to us? Yes. So if you're thinking yes, you are correct. Um, because the child was still solicited, even if the child said no and refused to engage in the sexual acts, we would still want to get that case um, because the child may have been successfully solicited for the purpose of commercial sex and may still be a victim of trafficking. Um, so this case, this child is a victim of sex trafficking. Um, you would submit that case to us and we would assess and issue what's called an eligibility letter which would allow this child to apply for benefits and services to the same extent as a refugee, and they would be considered a victim of sex trafficking. Um, and again, if they didn't engage and they refused to engage, we would still want you to submit that case our way um, because we would want to assess if they were successfully solicited for the purpose of commercial sex. All right, so the third test your knowledge. While waiting to cross the border, a 17-year-old boy is told by a stranger that he must carry drugs with him when he crosses into the United States. The stranger threatens to kill the boy if he does not carry the drugs. The child is apprehended after crossing the border and is found with drugs. So again, you wanna ask yourself, do you see any labor trafficking or sex trafficking? And then if so, what is your action means and purpose? And if not, what more questions would you ask? So in this case, I do see an indication of forced labor. I see indication of labor trafficking. A child is made to perform a labor or service of crossing drugs 
with threat of harm for non-compliance, they're threatened to be killed. So for my action, I would say recruited because the child was singled out and made to do something. For my means, I would say coercion because the child was threatened to be killed if they didn't comply. And for my purpose, I would say involuntary servitude because they were threatened to be um, harmed um, and made to work in relation to the threat of harm. In this case, I would wanna ask more questions and assess um, the general case. We also um, have to assess credibility in all cases. Um, and what we really wanna emphasize here is even if the child is made to do something that is quote, criminal in nature or what's considered in this case as forced criminality, they can still be considered a victim of trafficking if they're made to perform a labor or service against their will with threat of harm for non-compliance. They can still be considered a victim of trafficking. So even if you're working with a child that indicates that they had prior gain involvement or that they're, um, they report to you that they're a member of a gain or they worked for a gain, it's always important to come from that trauma-informed victim-centered lens and ask and assess um, if the child is a victim of trafficking, if they were able to walk away from performing the work, um, the reasons that they complied, whether it was against their will. Um, and so even in this case where the child was made to perform something criminal in nature, um, it was due to threat of harm for non-compliance. And so this child is considered a victim of labor trafficking um, and would be eligible for an eligibility letter from our office. Okay, one more test your knowledge. A child and her mother arrange the child's journey to the United States. The child's mother puts up their land as collateral for the cost of her journey. The child is planning to work in the United States. And once she turns 18 years old and does not currently have a job set up for her. Oh, sorry, it is planning to work in the United States once, once she turns 18 years old and does not currently have a job set up for her. If the debt is not paid in three years, her family will lose their land in Guatemala. So again, we wanna assess, are there any concerns of sex trafficking or labor trafficking? Um, if so, what was your action means and purpose? And if no, what more questions would you ask to assess if it's a case of labor trafficking or sex trafficking? So in this case, we would wanna assess what led to her mother and the child planning the journey to the United States. So you would wanna say, tell me more about your decision um, to, to arrange that journey with your mom. So let's say, oh, well, my dad told me that if I didn't come to work, um, that he would kill me and my mom, my mom and I. And my, that would be then considered a, potentially a victim of labor trafficking because the father was sending the child here for the purpose of working against her will. However, with the information we have here, we don't have any indication of any forced labor or commercial sex. We have a lot of indication of a child being vulnerable to experiencing that because they're traveling alone to the United States, they have um, debt, um, and they have a plan to work, even though they don't have a job currently set up for them. So this would be a case where it'd be really important to really assess, um, if you're working with a child in a shelter, it would be really important to assess the child's um, sponsor. It'd be really important to assess their plans um, once they're released to make sure that they're you know, safe and um, they're not threatened or exploited in relation to the debt or plan to work. It'd be really important to also safety plan with the child um, and help them to understand their rights in relation to working. Um, and who to call and what to do should they be forced to work against their will, encouraging them to reach out to the National Human Trafficking Hotline or Office of Refugee Resettlement National Call Center. Um, so this case in and of itself, this child is not a victim of trafficking, but is someone that is very vulnerable and are at high risk to experiencing trafficking. And so it would be really important to safety plan with them. So some common trends our office sees, we've gone through a lot of these, but you see a lot of cases where children are solicited to engage in commercial sex, particularly related to the cost of their journey, shelter, food, um, or other items in relation to having sex. Um, the child may be forced to work on their journey or forced to work for their caregiver. We see a lot of cases where children are forced to work while they're held for ransom, um, or they're brought here for the purpose of working, or they have a high debt and there's plans to work and they're fearful um, in relation to that debt and plan to work. We see a lot of cases where children are placed in the United States and then forced to work against their will um, due to debts, um, or the child may be recruited to run away and forced to work. Um, we also see cases where children are um, identified or solicited online and then brought here for the purpose of engaging in commercial sex or work. Um, children are forced to engage in forced criminality, such as that case we talked about earlier, where a child was um, made to transport drugs across the border against their will. Um, and we also see a lot of cases of involuntary sexual servitude where children are forced to um, perform sex acts and held against their will, as well as cases where children are both 
me to engage in labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Okay, so that was a lot of information. Um, if you have any questions related to any of those trends, again, put them in the chat box and we'll cover those questions at the end. Um, and what we wanna do now is kind of talk through what is that process for screening and identif identification of foreign national minors, including unaccompanied children. So again, this, this population is at high risk for exploitation due to a variety of factors. Um, one of the biggest reasons is that they are traveling alone to the United States. Um, they're in a new area. Um, maybe they don't know anyone. Um, they may have high debts um, or have prior exposure to community violence or other traumas that may lead to them being vulnerable to experiencing trafficking. Some general factors that may impact screening and identification. One, the child um, may actually not know that what they experienced is trafficking. They may view the exploitation as normal and not report it to you as such. So it's really important to ask um, open-ended, um, non-leading questions that help the child to disclose their experiences. Um, the child may also have complex trauma that may make it difficult to report what occurred. Um, they may um, not yeah, trust you or trust us as it relates to their trafficking experience. Um, maybe they have shame or guilt related or the trafficker coach them. Um, they may fear that they'll be deported um, or experience um, other um, consequences as a relate of relation to disclosing what happened to them. So it's really helpful to, you know, explain their rights and explain, um, just help them to feel safe um, and, and in disclosing their experience. Some, some key ways of asking trauma-informed and victim-centered questions, screening questions, are asking open-ended and non-leading questions, um, building that felt safety and trust, helping them to know that they're safe, meeting their, their really those basic needs, you know, um, of, of making sure they feel safe with food, set, uh, shelter, and other um, really basic needs before um, being able to really properly assess those, those higher level needs. And, some really helpful ways of asking questions are what's called TED questions. So I've asked, I've actually been using these questions throughout the presentation, um, but the best type of questions are TED questions for children. And they are TED um, because it's T, tell me about, E, explain, and D, describe. So the T, tell me about, um, I, I use it a few times and I said, tell me more about your time while you were held for ransom. Talk to me more about your relationship with that person. Tell me more about what you did day to day on your journey. Rather than saying, did you work on your journey or did you do this? Um, you want to, you know, you may have to end up asking those direct questions as follow up, but it's really important um, to first really uh, ask these general open ended questions um, that help the child to feel safe when disclosing. So these type questions can be really key and really helpful. So the reporting process for foreign national minor victims of trafficking. Um, one, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 as amended requires that federal, state, and local officials report to our office within 24 hours of identifying that a foreign national minor may be a victim of trafficking. So that video that we watched earlier, um, you have seen that, um, that, the, that the child may um, indicate to you that, they're, um, that if they're a victim of trafficking, that you need to report that to our office within 24 hours. And so many mandated reporters report to us, we receive cases from hospital workers, clinicians, child welfare workers, law enforcement, attorneys, um, lots of stakeholders working with foreign national victims. Um, and then again, you wanna make sure to follow your mandated reporting re requirements as um, the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act um, also updated CAPTA, um, the definition of child abuse to include human trafficking. So making sure to, to um, report with your local and state child welfare reporting, reporting requirements. To report to our office um, and request assistance on behalf of a foreign national minor victim of trafficking, um, one, there has to be some type of concerns that the child may have experienced forced labor or commercial sex at any point in their life and in any location um, here in the United States or outside of the United States. Um, two, that the minor is a non-lawful, a non-US citizen, non-lawful permanent resident, which, which would include unaccompanied children. Um, and then three, that the minor is currently under the age of 18 and is currently located in the United States. In order to request assistance from our office, one, you would create an account in Shepherd, um, which is our online case management system. And the link to Shepherd and information is on our website in the last slide of the presentation. Two, you would submit a request for assistance to us in Shepherd. And three, you would check your emails and log back into your Shepherd account um, to make sure that there's not additional questions or additional information to submit to us. Um, if you're in a situation where 
you're working with a child and you don't have sufficient time to uh, report a case and create an accountant shepherd, just let us know by calling and leaving a voicemail or emailing us and we can help walk you through the process to submit that case to us. So, so some determination types, once we receive the case from you, we'll assess um, whether there's indication of forced labor or commercial sex. And if the child did indicate, or if there is information to indicate that the child experienced trafficking, we'll issue what's called an eligibility letter. This letter does not expire and it allows the child to apply for benefits and services to the same extent as a refugee. The interim assistance letter um, is uh, a letter that provides 90 to 120 days of benefits to the same extent as a refugee, while we review the case and make sure um, and receive consultation to make sure that the child is or is not a victim of trafficking. So interim assistance letters may be issued in cases where there's some type of information to indicate the child may be a victim of trafficking, but we aren't quite sure yet. Whereas eligibility letters are issued where it's really clear that the child did experience forced labor or commercial sex. And then finally, we may issue denial in cases where a child, there's no indication of forced labor or commercial sex. Maybe the child experienced ransom or they were um, experienced some type of other um, type of abuse. If we issue a denial um, to a child, you can always resubmit that case to us. We encourage you to call and reach out if you have any questions, if you're not sure why um, they received a denial, we want it to be really clear. Um, but there's no consequence um, for a denial in, in resubmitting that case to our office. Benefits and services. So should a child receive an eligibility or interim assistance letter, they're eligible for benefits and services to the same extent as a refugee. Some of those benefits are laid out here on this chart and it includes refugee cash and medical assistance, supplemental security income, um, temporary assistance for needy families, supplemental nutritional assistance program, children's health insurance program, Medicaid, um, federal student financial aid, Job Corps, as well as the unaccompanied refugee minor foster care program. And then in addition to um, being eligible for those benefits to the same extent as a refugee, the child will also be eligible um, as soon as you submit the case to us for um, case management services through the Trafficking Victims Assistance Program. So these are trafficking specific comprehensive case management services available all throughout the United States, and they're specific to foreign national victims of trafficking. These case managers can help the children um, access and apply for those benefits that we just discussed. Um, we'll make sure, even if the child is in a shelter, we'll make sure to connect them to these case management services um, so that they're, they're aware of who the child is and the child can then um, access these services once they leave Office of Refugee Resettlement Care. Um, if the child is currently in a shelter, um, we want to make sure that that child is provided and, and is aware that they would need um, home studies and other supports before the release from the shelter if they are considered a victim of trafficking or a potential victim of trafficking. So if you have any questions and you're working in the Office of Refugee Resettlement Shelter Program, you can always reach out to us and we can help you connect you with someone from the Office of Refugee Resettlement who ha may have more information on that process. And some, finally, some case trends that our office sees in relation to the child eligibility process. Um, we've seen a huge increase in eligibility letters issued over recent years. In fiscal year 2019, we issued around 892 eligibility letters. Um, and in fiscal year 20, we issued around uh, 673. In recent months, we've seen a really huge increase in requests for assistance to our office. So thank you for your ongoing collaboration and coordination in submitting those cases our way. In terms of type of trafficking, um, these are numbers from fiscal year 20 data. Pretty consistent with what we see throughout. We more, more often than not see cases of labor trafficking of minors. Um, so in fiscal year 20, we saw around 74% of labor trafficking, 20% sex and 6% both labor and sex trafficking. Um, and then we often mostly receive cases for male labor trafficking victims. So as you see here, the majority of our cases are male labor trafficking victims. Um, and most of our cases come from Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Mexico, as well as um, East Africa, as well as in Asia. But we receive cases on behalf of children from all over the world, um, but most often from, uh, again, from El Salvador, hum Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico. And then finally, here's my contact information. I can be reached both at my, my personal email and phone number, lauren.divine at acf.hhs.gov or phone 202-205-5778. Or you can reach out to us at our child trafficking, child eligibility email at childtrafficking at acf.hhs.gov 
or case staffing phone line at 202-205-4582. And then the Shepherd website is shepherd.otip.acf.hhs.gov. And then again, here's our OTIP website, acf.hhs.gov slash OTIP.